the Living Edge song was um, something that was approached very carefully. Um, B.A. Robertson was his idea, and he, and very much his lyric. We both lost our fathers um, about the same time, and we both had uh, new babies about the same time. So the story of, 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 of communication and losing your father and never seeing the new, the new grandchild was, was common to both of us. Um, but we were kind of worried about writing a song about, about death, you know, we thought if it didn't work it could have been horribly sort of, could have been corny and wrong, so it was quite a risk to do it. Um, and I think that in a sense that risk was part of what made it even more satisfying. Um, and for both of us, quite emotional to do, you know, a couple of times we had to leave the room a couple of times really because um, those beautiful words sort of just seemed to encapsulate really what what those emotions are about. Um, and the other thing we should, I should mention actually is that not so well known is that of course Paul Carrick lost his father um, when he was quite young, very young in fact. So in a sense I think when Paul sang it, and he sang it so beautifully, I think his emotions about his father and himself kind of came out in the regular performance, um, which kind of made the song even, even better for it. There's a nice story how my living his book started really. My, my father died in 86 and my mother in early 2000 and, and I inherited these three trunks which sat upstairs above my studio in the attic for many years. When is the right time to delve into your past? I don't know. One day I was having a non-writing day, a bit dry of ideas, I went upstairs and my grandfather's trunk was there too and inside it I found two book he'd written about army doctoring and nice reviews and, and, and publishers notes and they were published and successful. My father's trunk I found his, his manuscript uh, of his memoirs which he'd written and was unpublished and so I'm sitting there with two written books, an unpublished manuscript um, which is very funny my father's book and so the idea sort of starts to think in your head there's a legacy there which I should listen to. I then assembled a photograph album uh, from photographs from my father from the, from the trunks. On the left hand page is him, on the right hand page is me, and door 21 is the same people. Young boys at school, on bicycles, riding a horse, but then s suddenly at 21, I'm um, got long hair, double neck guitar, and taking drugs, and he's sort of on the singing of Bismarck, you know, at war. So suddenly the story, how the life changes hugely, became an idea for me to, to do it. I've always had a fascination with the generational change from my father's era, who was born in 1906, you know, had two world wars, and they came out of World War II, I think, shell-shot. And until my generation, Young men of 20 want to become their fathers, wear the same trousers, wear the same jackets, do the same things. And something happened in the early 60s with the Beatles and I suppose England sort of in shock after the World Wars and this kind of cultural change happened. And I think that that huge generational change um, hasn't been written about very much. And so the book is about, obviously it's about the band, Genesis the Mechanics and Peter and Phil and Tony and Ant, but it's also about that era in the UK which I think was, was pretty much unique and led the world too, I think. And so in, in the book I covered the fact, you're trying to imagine my father, all his life in the Navy, son educated at a, a top school and then being told, Dad, I'm going to be in a band. You can't really imagine quite what it must have been like for him to, to deal with it. Uh, but I suppose my father was a retired naval officer, but quite wise, having gone around the world many times and, and fought in the war, that I think he was able to think that actually, if you're obsessed about it, try it. Um, and I'm sure my father thought, give him two years, you'll grow out of it. Um, but it's, it's hard to imagine nowadays what it was like, because the idea of having a career in music, in those days, it was like, you're doing what? You know, there was no career to be had. I'm sure my father was wise enough to know that actually he couldn't talk me out of it, being in the band. So the best thing would be to just let it ride, and I'm sure he hoped it would just fizzle out. Um, luckily, he lived long enough to see the band do well, which is for me very satisfying. 
um, and he'd come to see our he'd come to see our concerts and he'd put his earplugs in as we as the lights went down for the first song. I don't blame him at all, but it was still uh, very foreign to him. But I think he enjoyed just seeing um, his son starting a serious career. I think one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of with Genesis, and it's in the book too about this, is the fact that we're still, still friends. We don't see each other all, all the time like that at all. But I feel that appreciation of each other, what we did together and shared, is still intact. It's tough when bands break up and they fall out and become lacrimonious because of those memories are then slightly damaged. Um, and I still feel that all our memories are very much, very much intact. And actually the last photograph in the book, in the picture section, is um, of us all together. About 10 years ago, we did a photograph with, with, with uh, Steve and Pete and Phil. I, I think I put the, the quote is, um, or the caption is, still talking. I look back on the Genesis years and, and the Mechanics years, there's been so much laughter. I mean, it's a tough life on the road, traveling, scheduling, flying, no sleep, time changes. If you're not friends having fun, it's pretty grim. Um, and most of our time is spent just laughing, really. The age-old question about Genesis, will we do anything together again? I think it's unlikely. Um, there are no plans. I've always said for years, my answer is never say never.